Fortuna is a witch. More specifically, she's a fortune teller who has never been wrong. Even before ascending to join an intergalactic coven, Fortuna read tarot cards on Earth, and whatever she looks into, whether it's the past or the future, she is always correct. So when she foretells the downfall of her coven, they don't take the news well. Idana, the leader of Fortuna's sisterhood, exiles her to a millennium of isolation on an asteroid, confiscating her tarot deck and cutting her off from the people who give her so much purpose. Over 200 years of her sentence, Fortuna struggles with depression, the responsibility of her powers, and the enormity of her immortality. In short, she meets her wit's end. So with nowhere else to turn, she breaks her coven's sacred laws. She chooses forbidden magic and summons an outlawed behemoth to help her win her freedom. Abramar, the deity that she frees, forges a contract with her, granting her renewed access to the four elements of cosmic magic, earth, water, air, and fire. Through these energies, Abramar teaches her to construct her own divination deck, one more powerful than traditional tarot, a deck that, one way or another, will get her out of her prison. Not long after that, it just so happens that an Arbiter, a member of the Witch Police of this universe, shows up. You see, she's begun reviewing Fortuna's punishment. So long as there's no illegal activity going on, she deems that 200 years of isolation is more than enough for Fortuna's crime. While she can't overturn the exile completely, she does grant Fortuna visitation rights. So Fortuna's luck turns, but how? Was this timing sheer coincidence? Was Abramar pulling strings without her knowing? Did Fortuna even need to summon him? Did she do the right thing? Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood is easily one of the best games I have played in 2023. This is a narrative adventure game that tugs on the threads of deck building games, walking sims, and perhaps most importantly, choose your own adventure games. The writing, the creativity, and the ethical dilemmas that this game puts you in the middle of are some of the best that I have encountered in the video game space, and I really want to explain why. Almost from the off, Abramar, who I soon recognized as a mouthpiece for the developers as they checked in on me from time to time, told me that my choices as Fortuna would have dramatic impacts. Such a warning is fairly commonplace for any game that boasts about having branching paths and wants to put player choice center stage. Seven different endings are the result here, and although your choices won't really impact the larger plot of the game, they will, even down to the way you design your tarot cards, create massive ripples that impact who Fortuna is, the state of her relationships, and even the cosmos around her. If you've played any choose-your-own-adventure games before, you might be starting to tune out at this point. I know I probably would be. On the whole, I find these types of games to be disappointingly shallow because they never truly follow through on their promises. They can, in the end, only cater to a certain number of outcomes. They can only provide ideal dialogue options for a limited range of players. And what's more, their choices are always so signposted that you pretty much always know when you need to act in a certain way to get the good ending. In my eyes, this is the weakness at the heart of these games' ethical dilemmas. It's that problem from the middle seasons of The Good Place. If you know you're being watched and your actions are being judged, your motivations are corrupt. You're just doing a good thing because you want the reward. That, put simply, is where I think the Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood truly stands apart from its peers. Just like The Last Clockwinder, channeling a bit of player creativity into this game's design really makes it feel distinct. Let me explain. The divination deck Fortuna constructs is designed by you. Each card you create is made up of three parts that are all based in one of the four elements Abramar lets you access. You might want your card's background to be the Opera House, but you'll need a certain amount of air magic stored up to buy it. You gain these elemental tokens by investing them in cards you design. During a reading, if you pull a card that's predominantly made up of air elements and read a corresponding fortune with it, you'll get air tokens back that you can then spend on your next card's design. Here's the kicker though. Those four energies each represent certain qualities. Fiery fortunes are darker and could seal the cosmos into more chaotic outcomes. Water and air cards could mean loving fortunes where people act more kindly to one another, and earth heavy cards will almost always be distinct from the others too. Okay, so you might think, never invest in fire, or only invest in the energies that you like best. 
Well, you could, but an overabundance of one energy in a card can actually mean weaker fortunes, or even create the opposite effect from what you might want. What's more, later in the game you'll get the opportunity to buy Super Arcana, card components that might cost 5 fire, 6 earth, and 3 air. These are the most powerful card parts in the game, but to use them you need stores of every energy, so you need balance in your deck. When you achieve that balance, that's when readings get the most engaging. If one card is made up of multiple elements, it could bring up a potentially fiery fate for you to read, a loving fate, or something totally out of left field. Your heart might want you to choose a fate based on what you want for the character you're reading for, but your bank of stored up magic and your knowledge of what you might need more of later could sway you against your morals. Whichever you read is correct, remember. Fortuna is infallible. In other words, you are pulling all the strings, and the game is always giving you opportunities to act selfishly. I find this all really impressive, because in almost every other game where your choices impact the story, you often have nothing to gain and nothing to lose from choosing one way or the other. But as Fortuna, you have ulterior motives at every turn. Not to mention freedom from judgement, because if someone doesn't like the impending fate you just chose for them, they don't even know you chose it. It's just the cards they've been dealt. Because the game invites you to act selfishly, you're almost always tempted to. It introduces morally grey options to a medium which, for the most part, makes you think in only right or wrong binaries. For example, your pacifist run in a game like Dishonored may ensure that you don't kill anyone, but sentencing Lady Boyle to a lifetime of agony with this freak? or cursing the High Overseer with the Heretic's brand are probably fates worse than death for those characters. Beyond I don't have blood on my hands, where is the moment of ethical consideration? Did you ever really weigh up the consequences of your morally virtuous action? Or did you just want the clean hands trophy? The Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood is such a fresh take on ethics in the video game space. Even games like The Outer Worlds, The Witcher 3, Detroit Become Human that make ethical problem solving part of their appeal started to pale in comparison to this. And that's saying something, because I really like those games. <laughs> We need to talk. <laughs> the Witcher 3's Bloody Baron quest is the first one in the game that really forces you to grapple with an ethical dilemma. This quest always stuck out to me a lot more than other early game content because it's a lot more character driven than the ones you encounter before it, and it really sets the tone for how you'll roleplay as Geralt. On the Witcher's search for Ciri, he's led to Crow's Perch, the home of the Bloody Baron. Ciri stayed here for a short time, and so when Geralt arrives asking for information, the Baron offers it to him for a price. You see, his family has gone missing, and he claims he has no idea what's happened to them and doesn't know any reason why they might leave his side, but if Geralt can help him locate his wife and daughter, he'll tell him where Ciri went. After a brief chat with a peller in a nearby town, the Baron's true nature soon reveals itself. Far from the down-to-earth town leader you might hope that he is, he's actually an abusive drunkard who lied to you. It turns out that in one of his drunken rages, he had beaten his pregnant wife and caused her to have a miscarriage. In shame, the Baron buried the stillborn babe quickly without ceremony or respect, and in doing so, created a botchling, a disfigured and malicious version of his undead baby that's cursed to feed on pregnant women. As a Witcher, Geralt now knows that he has the choice to either slay the botchling, take its corpse to the nearby soothsayer and get clues about the family's location, or turn the botchling into a lubberkin, a benevolent spirit of the undead baby. So this is quite the heavy ethical dilemma for you to weigh up, but the game definitely hints which it wants you to choose. The Baron, now totally ashamed of his actions, pleads with you not to kill his child. So for a start, you have a character-driven motivation to bring about some kind of resolution or redemption in this situation. Not only that, but the choice for you to kill the botchling is definitely the harder way to go. This boss fight is a noticeable step up in difficulty from anything in the game to that point. And what's more, there's a heftier time investment when you complete a ritual with the Peller to get the clues about the family that you need. The other option is far more ethical, and is definitely repaid by easier gameplay. You need to protect the Baron as he buries the botchling in a more ceremonious manner, while it spawns wraiths that attack you both. When the Lubberkin arises though, 
it'll guide you to the same clues you'd have gotten from the Peller's Ritual. And although narratively this finishes the quest on a more positive note, taking this path doesn't really change very much. After playing both ways, things start to ring a little bit hollow, because in truth, there's no tangible punishment and no tangible reward for you choosing either way. You'll still get information on Ciri, you'll still get access to Onward Quest with the Baron as he deals with his guilt, and while you might have a feeling that you did the right thing, it will likely dawn on you that this choice was quite an easy one, because even if you struggled with that botchling fight, you have an opportunity with every death to choose the good way this time. You could think of that harder gameplay as some kind of punishment, but all you really lose there is your time, and at the end of the day, it's just more time spent playing a video game that you, the player, are probably enjoying in the first place. Now, I love The Witcher 3, and I actually love this quest, but I think the lack of difference in whatever way you choose here actually serves my point that even games like these that I love pretty much always present ethical solutions in a simplistic, good and bad way. Whether this type of writing is to allow for multiple playstyles or it's bound by technical limitations, I just feel like these games don't really understand that what makes ethical choices difficult in real life is the personal cost to the decision maker. We often already know what the good and the bad choices are to make in almost any situation, so the slap on the wrist we get for choosing the wrong way doesn't really hold that much weight in a video game. In real life, what we stand to gain and what we stand to lose, in spite of these inherently good and bad choices, is what makes them challenging. Video games often fail to give us that personal stake in their ethical problems beyond evoking guilt for a virtual character we all know isn't actually experiencing what we subject them to. Beyond a guilt-inducing, Roman will remember this, do we ever really lose anything long-lasting for letting side characters down? Now, don't get me wrong, I never want to make side characters unhappy either, and I hardly ever play the evil way, but... I think that's because I'm never really incentivized enough to want to. The Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood, on the other hand, actively gives you a horse in the race of every fortune you read. You're almost always incentivized by an ulterior motive to go against your sense of ethics. What's more, your options aren't limited to a binary good or bad choice, there are constantly morally grey options that bargain for your attention. When it comes to the late game, a plot point I won't spoil means there's an even greater weight of responsibility on your readings, and because you've engineered the cards that are dictating everything, you wonder to yourself just how much of this is happening because you have selfishly willed it into being, and whether it's even ethically right for you to use Fortuna's powers in the first place. What right do any of us have to be judge, jury, and executioner when we have something to gain from playing those roles. What is truly selfish? Is there such a thing as a wholly selfless act? Can your motives in moral decision making ever be uncorrupted? And how can our actions, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, ripple into larger waves that impact those around us? These are the questions the Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood asks you as a player. Because unlike so many choice-based games, it admits that to be selfless, to choose the moral high ground that we hope is the noble act of a hero, we often have to sacrifice someone's happiness. We simply can't please everyone. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I hope you enjoyed the little chat about ethics in video games. We are getting really, really close to a thousand subscribers at the moment. So if you aren't subscribed and if you enjoyed this video, you want to see more, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell icon as well because then you'll get notified whenever we upload in the future. And uh, I think that's everything I really have to plug at the moment, uh, is just the subscribe button. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this and I hope to see you again soon. Tune in next time.